So let me start with this message because this is going to prep us for what we're going to experience this next week. I believe, this is my personal belief, okay? And I think I can back it up scripturally, which I will. But I believe that a price for a full life is going to be summed up in failures. And nobody wants to talk about failures. I mean, when you think about different people in our history that have failed, let's just take Thomas Edison. He failed over a thousand times. And nobody remembers him for the thousand times of failure. Everyone remembers him for creating the light bulb. So yes, he failed a thousand times, but at a thousand and one, bam, let there be light. And there was light, right? And so I believe that a price for, for, a, full, for a full life in every single one of our life is going to be filled of, of failures, mistakes, and even bad decisions. Every, no one gets away from this. Every single one of us will have failures in our life. And we've all made them here, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whether you're young, whether you're in your mid-age, old age, everyone here has failed, made mistakes, made poor decisions. And guess what? And you will still make some poor decisions. And you're still going to make some mistakes. And you're still going to fail in certain areas, whether it's relationship, whether it's your integrity, whether it's your character, whether it's your family, whether it's in business, whether it's in relationships. We are all going to come to a place where this is going to happen. Look at your neighbor and say, calm down. And then just go like this, okay? Just for interaction, just say, it's okay. No, but with your hands. Come on, help me, please. It's okay. But listen, but you're either, but you're either moving forward, staying the same, or you're going back. You're either moving forward in your failure, you're either staying the same in your failure, or you are either falling back to your same failure. In other words, you know, you know where you keep missing it, but you can easily go back and default to that cycle, that pattern of life if you don't do something about it. And I know, I think out of all those three, it's easier just to stay the same because there is no effort to change. So we learn to coexist with our failure. As a matter of fact, beyond coexisting with failure, you know how we really coexist? We, we co-define. We identify with our failure. We identify with our mistakes. We identify with our disappointments, our poor choices. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you start identifying yourself as a failure. Failure is not who you are. Failure is what you did. Mistake is not who you are. Mistake is what you did. Bad choice is not what you are. Bad choice is what you made. Are you hearing me today? And so we all have to come to this divine conclusion that we all struggle in some way. For example, my struggle, my challenge, my failures look way different than yours. Just like the person sitting next to you, completely different than each other's struggles, failures. I mean, whatever it is. But one thing that I have noticed is I have studied the scripture. At the end of the day, if we all draw near to God, we can draw strength and redemption and forgiveness from heaven above. As a matter of fact, do you know what the same bottom line for all of us is? Is that God is faithful. We all come to the same bottom line. He is faithful. He is loving. He is forgiving. He is redeeming. He is faithful. There is always a path forward because Jesus made a way. Always a path forward. God always provides a path. He says, I'm the way, Mauricio. I'm the truth, Mauricio. And I'm the life, Mauricio. Now, here's the path I've made. Jesus has already made a way. Now, here is the challenge part. It's your choice. You can choose to stay the same. You can choose to stay stuck. You can choose to keep making excuses why you still have the same attitude, why you still have the same point of view, why you're still in pain, why you're still broken. I'm not, listen, I'm not saying it's not okay to be broken. That's our next series. But I am saying, but there has to be a time of process when you have to get back up and you have to move forward. 
But hopefully, even in the midst of our failure, hopefully we learn from them. Because if you don't learn from them, you know what happens to you and I? We stay indebted to that failure for the rest of our life. You keep paying for it. You keep paying for it. You're in debt to it. You're a slave to it. You're in prison to it. And so you have to make a decision whether or not you are going to move on. Now, whether you're a believer or maybe you're someone sitting in our church today and you're like, man, I'm not even used to this church thing. Like, man, like some threatened me to come to church today. I don't know what they did. How they, I don't know how they got you here. But listen, whether you're a good person, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a non-Christian, Every single one of us can, can understand this, that failure is inevitable. Nobody gets away. Nobody gets away from failure. Every single one of us are going to experience this. For example, let me give you a quick story because my time is going. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so let me, let me set this up. So there's a story of a young man, okay, and this young man um, was basically sitting in a church service like you are right now. He was sitting in the church service and was listening to the preaching like you're listening to me. And I think we're all going to learn something in this story. I really believe that. Ready? Acts chapter 20, verse 9 through 10. It says, a young man named Eutychus. That's a jacked up name, huh? Eutychus. How many would name their child that? Eutychus. Anybody? No? Okay. Eutychus was sitting in a window. He was sitting where? Okay, so just picture this. So he's on the third floor. He's sitting at a window. And mind you, if you're sitting on a window ledge, how many think that you would be sitting your butt backwards to the hole of the window? No, you wouldn't, right? What would you do? You would put one foot where? Out of the window, and you'd put the other foot where? Inside the house, right? Why? Because you want to make sure you keep a balance. Let me paint the picture for you. Some of us sometimes, okay, in church and outside of church, sometimes we have one foot in the world. And we have one foot in the church. I want to paint the picture for all of us. We've all been there. Everybody say, nobody gets away. Nobody gets away. Say it again. Failure is inevitable. inevitable. So let's stop being religious. We've, we've all failed. We've all made mistakes. Even the Pope has failed. Don't get offended, my Catholics. <laughs> Look at this. Sitting in a window. I used to be Catholic, so don't trip. He sank, listen, he sank into a what? Deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Man, you better be careful not to fall asleep when we're preaching. Because look what happens. He was sound asleep. And Eutychus what? Eutychus what? What happens when you're sleeping? You fall. What happens when you're not paying attention? You fall. What happens when you're not in discernment? What happens when you're not getting... The right counsel? Okay, so Eutychus, he fell from the third floor. And when they picked him up from the ground, he was dead. Paul went down and threw himself on the young man. He put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed. He told him, he's alive. Think about it. This guy is sitting on the window ledge. He's listening to the message. Paul's trying to bring life. So I just tells you, man. If this dude thought Paul was boring, something was wrong with him. This is the Apostle Paul, man. We're talking about there was no other preacher like this guy. And he falls asleep. And as he falls asleep, he literally falls from the third floor and boom, he is dead. The disciples go down like, Eutychus. (laughs) Paul, he's dead. But, But you know what? Notice, highlight what Paul says. It says that Paul embraced him and hugged him and put his arms around him and then he said there is still life in him what if the church what if us as believers what if we were to embrace broken hurting people what if we were to embrace those that are so sinful and so lost and so gone what if we were to embrace ugly what if we were to embrace our community What if we were to embrace those people you work with that you call annoying, that irritate you, that boss you don't like? What if we were like the Apostle Paul and said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to embrace them. Because anytime I try to love on them, man, they're like asleep. 
Like they don't care. They don't even pay attention. They don't even, they don't even treat me like I even exist as if I'm even present in the room. Have you ever been treated that way? But Paul said he hugged him. He put his arms around him. And he said, but there's still life in him. And I think sometimes when we fail, people are so quick to judge, so quick to cast the first stone. Whether it's someone who's cast the stone on you or whether it's you who's cast the stone on others, it happens. But we have to be the kind of people, the body of Christ, like Jesus who showed up on Family Throne Night on that video. I didn't know he was there. I just saw him. I'm like, oh, my God, Jesus came. <laughs> he embraced us. That's the heart of God for people. I want, I want you to know today that your failure is not final. That God loves you no matter how far you are away from him. No matter, no matter if you doubt God, no matter if, you, if you're angry at God, God, listen, God is going to embrace you. God's going to love you in your ugliest moment, in your beautiful moment, in your greatest moment. God is going to embrace you. You know why? Because there's still life in you. Do you realize that the only reason you and I, I'll say it this way, the best sign that we know that God has embraced us is the fact that you and I woke up this morning we are sitting in church. That tells me that the favor of God is still on your life. The favor of God is still on your life. Come on, because God, God has been fighting darkness just for us, guys. He's been fighting darkness just to get to you, just to get to me. You know, I've always been competitive. I've always been the kind of person that wants to win in life. You know, I don't like losing. Anybody like losing? Like, I don't like losing anything, board games, you know, baseball game, football. Not, I don't like losing in anything. I like to win, win, win. Even in church, man, I'm a, I like winning. I don't like losing in church. I like, to, I like to give us an experience from heaven every time we come here. Like, that's my desire. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you know what? I used, to, uh, I used to play professional ball when I was younger. And, uh, and one of the things about professional ball and, and playing with, with a team is number one, you gotta have the right they. Who's the right who's the right they? Winners. You gotta you gotta get with people that are competitive. You gotta get around people that also have the same vision, the same dream, the same, you know, tenacity. Like, man, we're gonna kill them. We're gonna, we're gonna so our team was critical, you know. Who was I gonna bring on? Who was gonna connect with us? Who were we gonna invite? Who was gonna be a part of our and so um, we made sure we got the right team. But as teams were being picked, there was this one guy who sucked. Hey, listen, we've all sucked in life, every single one of us. And this guy sucked because he just didn't have the skill set, man. He was just a little awkward. You know, I, I think that he wasn't blessed in the balanced life area. You know, he just, just wasn't blessed, man. Because you know what? When you think about that, man, we know when you're in third grade and you're playing kick, you know, kickball, you need professional people on your team. You know what I'm saying? So I'm in third grade playing pro ball. And, uh, and, and, and so here's the deal. We already knew. Listen, even though I was a really tough kid, you know, I, I made my way through school with my fist and just always just, just being a bad kid. But I still had a little bit of goodness in me. But we all knew that nobody would pick this dude because everyone, every team would always say, that guy sucks, we don't want him there. Like, just talk bad about him. So what we would do every recess while we were playing pro kickball, <laughs> I would say, okay, hey, you suck, come over here. And, <laughs> and we would get him, and we'd only hit him kick one time. And that was it when we were losing, right? And we're like, okay, kick now. But no, no, but, but listen to me, listen to me. How did, okay, Pastor, what, how does this apply? It totally applies. Think about it. God's, God's love is unfair. His grace is unfair. His mercy, it's so unfair. God is so unfair. If the next time someone tells you and says, God is unfair, tell me, you know what? You're so right because you're so ugly and he still loves you. I mean, he's so unfair, like, he's so, but he still chose you. 
you can suck in life. You can be a horrible person in life. You can be someone that maybe, you know what, you're a failure with intention, and God still would choose you. Because while the devil will whisper in your ear, you're not good enough, you're not a part of God's will, you're not a part of God's plan, God doesn't love you, God will literally stomp on that snake and say, no, you know what? It doesn't matter how far you are. I love you. I choose you. I see the best in you. God's not trying to define you based on your failures, your mistakes, your bad decisions. God is trying to get you to define yourself and identify yourself with who he is. And then his love compels you to change and to move forward. But until you know his love, you will not move forward. You will stay the same. You'll have the same attitude, the same point of view. You have to know him. Until you know him, you won't, comp you won't be compelled to move forward. I know that today is, you know, uh, uh, what's the whole thing with the clock thing? It's uh, fall back. That's the problem with the church, always falling back. God's done with the church falling back. God's saying, hey, I didn't die. My son didn't die for you to fall back. My son died so that you can move forward. Press forward towards the goal, towards the, the blessing, the dream, the, the, the healing, the restoration. God's saying, forward, not fall back. We got too many fall backers. Too many. But I can understand why. You know, the devil just comes and he, he'll jack you up. Listen, the attitude after failure, put that point up, guys. The attitude after you fail defines your altitude. It really does. What do I mean by that? Well, the altitude and the attitude work together. You have to realize that. Because sometimes I think that we, we want to move forward, we want to change, but we're not repentive. We're not really sorry. As a matter of fact, when we say sorry to someone, the only reason you're saying sorry is because you got caught. But true repentance is, you know what? Lord, please forgive me. Before you repent to the person, repent to God. Because that's where your identity comes from. And when you identify with Jesus Christ, it's so much easier than to not just say I'm sorry to someone. But the true form of sorry or the true form of repentance is change of behavior. Then that says, forgive me. But if you have the same, the same everything, the same attitude, listen. It, it also tells you your altitude. It tells you whether or not you're going to go higher. It tells you whether or not you're going to move forward. It tells you whether or not you're going to go and reach for the greater things that God has for you. But it's so key. But the key is this, is you have to learn from your failures in order not to repeat them. Because some of us can be so naive. And, and when we love, we love to hear this whole thing of grace but grace without repentance, right? It's just a license to keep doing what we want to do. It doesn't work that way. And so we want to we wanna change. You know, then I found out why they called this guy Eutychus. Because Eutychus, if you were him too, if you would have fell off the third floor, right? <laughs> you would like, what? Is oh, my bad. <laughs> okay, that was a stupid joke. Okay. Eutychus, Eutychus too. No, that makes sense. No. <laughs> Drinking tea. Okay, quickly, let's go. Running out of time. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. I want to show you this because uh, I believe that hell wants to paralyze you and mock you for your mistakes. But let me show you how the high priest, even a righteous person, is being persecuted by Satan. It says, then the angel showed me Joshua, or Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, everybody say the accuser. The accuser, the accuser who? Satan. Satan. So you better watch where you're pointing that little finger because then I'm about to, listen, then I have to ask you, who's your daddy? Because the accuser is Satan. So anytime you start accusing people of stuff, anytime you start talking down about people, churches, huh? God's people, unsaved people, you better watch it because you're no different than the accuser. 
watch the judgment because the same judgment you give, you give is the same judgment that's going to come back on you. Be careful. Never rejoice over someone's fall because it will come back. So Satan was there at the angel's right hand. How can the devil be right in the presence of God? I'll tell you how, because he's good at accusing. That's his role. Making accusations against Yeshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusation. Aren't you glad that you have someone to defend you? Even when it's your fault. God's like, I'll step in. He said, I reject your accusation saying, yes, the Lord who has chosen, who has what? Chosen. Come on. Nobody wanted to pick that kid, but we chose him. He didn't deserve it. He wasn't qualified, but God chose you. He chose you and he rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. See, I think so often we forget the fact that God literally saved us from hell. And, and then we don't learn to give back that same grace, that same love, that same embracing, that same attitude of, but there's still life in him. He can still change, right? Some of us have looked as you're getting ready for Thanksgiving. Some of you, you know you're going to go see Uncle Drink a lot again. Sister, tell it all, right? You're going to go see all these family members that you probably don't like, right? The in-laws, you know, some of, the, some of the siblings you don't like. Like the moment you say the word Thanksgiving, some people are like, oh, my God, it's here again. You know, and we start, we start dreading. But let me tell you something about that person who is so annoying, who is so irritable to you, is that you, like the Apostle Paul, you, like Jesus, the Jesus who lives in you, you can say, yeah, you know what, man, they're annoying, but this year I'm going to believe God because there's still life in them. Because we can already start summing up all their failures while you're mad at them. But we forget that we were that stick in the fire too. We'll leave it at that right there. But what does heaven respond? Heaven responds, I want to make you. I want to transform you. I want to change you. Because we've all had plenty of mistakes. I'm telling you, all of us have had that. And, and, and here's the deal. Uh, I think... When we, as we're getting ready for this, this whole family conference, this is us. I think as parents, we've all made mistakes. There's no perfect parent. I got two great kids. Listen, I love them. They're great. They love Jesus with all their heart. They're legit. They do. But they're crazy. <laughs> they ain't perfect. And, and I can say that throughout my parenting, I didn't do the greatest job as a dad, you know, yeah, I led them, I've, my wife and I, we've led them in the Bible. We've led them in the path of Jesus. We've, we've embraced them. We've sat with them. We've spent time with them. We've poured into them. We've framed them. we shaped them. we formed them. We've done all those things, praise God. But even then, there's some things, mistakes that we made that we can't change now because they're adults now. But just because they're adults doesn't mean that we still can't make some changes to go ahead and be a model for them even now in their adulthood. Some of you parents, you better start making some changes now because the culture of parenting today is goofy. Like I have seen moms and dads, Christians, that forbid themselves to say the word no to their child. It's the stupidest thing. It's like, okay, don't say, don't say no to your child because you'll, you'll, you'll hurt them for the rest of their life. We need to find an alternative to no, okay? Why? Because we want to empower them to make the right decision. No! <laughs> You're the parent. Your job is to say no when it's no and yes when it's yes. They need to know righteousness from evil. They need to know from good to bad. So where did we get this goofy mindset of just saying to our children, no, uh, I mean, yes, but no. <laughs> like, where, where did, like, where did this come from? It is so crazy. That's why some of you are jacked up right now. Because <laughs> your parents didn't tell you no. The Bible says, do not spare the rod. Now, there's a difference of spanking and abuse. God never said abuse your children, okay? He said, don't spare the rod, all 
All right? My kids had the anointing of spanking on their life. <laughs> and listen, and they're still good, and they love God, and they love Jesus. You know what we've done as the church? We are completely making destructive children for the future, and that is wrong. You want to raise your children? Raise them up God's way, not the world's way. The world's way is not going to lead them into the path of righteousness. It's not going to happen. And so for me, I just kind of look at them like, man, you can be failing right now as a parent. Because you're afraid to correct them. You're afraid to instruct them. You're afraid to rebuke them. Oh, their feelings are going to be hurt. So what? They're going to lie. They're going to live. Oh, my Lord. Oh, it's because I want them to go to that party. But, you know, because I don't want them to be angry at me when, I'm, when, when they're older and hate mom. I'm like, they don't even like you right now. What the, who cares? <laughs> like, who cares? A T- little temporary pain It's going to go a long way. Okay, let's move on. That's what the, don't miss, this is us. It's going to be good. Or listen, or maybe in marriage. Listen, we can all get better in marriage, can't we? There's no perfect marriage. You know, I, I'm a very private guy. You know, like people are saying, how come you don't post it? Because I'm private, man. Now shut up, right? God, it's like, what do you want me to do? Be like everybody else? <laughs> you know, it's like, no. It, it, but, but listen, but it doesn't mean that we're not improving, that we're not getting better. Then we're not, we're not elevating. We, we all have to make sure that we, we realize that even now in our marriages, we can be making mistakes, poor decisions, or we can be failing completely, but we can always get better at it. How about in business? Come on, be proactive. Come on, be a thinker. Get the right people around you. Get the right counsel. Or maybe you're physically or spiritually unhealthy. Then do something about it. Don't just sit there and keep being an emotional wreck. Get some help. Come on, ask us, hey, where can I get some help? Let us direct you whether we can do it or whether we can refer you to someone that can do it. But at the end of the day, you have a choice to make. You could either move forward or you can stay the same or what else can you do? Or fall back. It's your choice. You have to make a decision. But I'm here to remind you that failure is not final. It's not final. God is bigger than your failure. So fall forward. Look at Micah 7, 8, quickly. He said, do not rejoice over me. Amen, my tragedies. Oh, my enemy. Though I what? Though I what? Now, mind you, Micah was another great prophet of God. Though I fall, I will Though I sit in the darkness of distress, the Lord is. Let me. You can be in the most deepest, darkest place of your life. The holidays are a blessing to some. For others, it's a curse. Why? Because it reminds them of maybe people they've lost, people that have passed away, relationships that were broken, marriages that failed, people that were divorced. So for some people, it's pain. You know, while you're enjoying the holidays, other, listen, most people, the highest rate of suicide is November, December. Highest every single year. And it keeps getting higher and higher. Well, let me tell you something. Here, Micah says, even in my darkest distress, the Lord is my light. I'm here to tell someone. Now, if you're, if you're feeling in that deep, dark space, God knows how to light you up. God knows how to be your strength. God loves you. Listen, you may feel like a failure because you feel like I've been in this depression for a very long time. You may feel like, man, I'm never going to get out of this. That's the lie of the enemy. He'll make you feel like you're a failure like you're a reject. But God's saying, I still choose you. I still love you. You may be down, but down is not your destiny. You understand me? Down is not your destiny. You may have failed, but you are not the failure. You may have made a mistake, but you're not the mistake. And you have to remind yourself of the goodness of God. 
And I love this because Micah said, though I fall, I will get back up. And though I fall, I will rise again. The forces of darkness cannot stop what God has ordained for my life. That's what we have to say. What God has ordained, nothing can stop God. But that takes a divine conviction. That takes faith to say, listen, even when you don't have faith, hook up with another anchor. There's Jeremy. I love Jeremy. Jeremy's a great guy. Guys, if you need a great guy to go talk to, man, that's an anchor. We got Gilbert. Gilbert is around here somewhere. Gilbert, if you need an anchor, go to Gilbert. Huh? For us men, because us men, we're the worst at sharing our stuff. We suck. We're just not good. You know why? Because we'd rather isolate. But isolation is an assassination. Same comes. Pastor Edgar, right here, lift your hand, Pastor Edgar. Pastor Edgar's there. There's a lot of great men in this church. A lot of great guys. Steve De La Rosa right here in the front row. He'll make you laugh, then he'll smack you. <laughs> just, just stating the facts, Steve. Just stating the facts. Just the facts. Look at this. Failure is not, number one, it's not avoidable. Failure is not an event. Failure is a process, guys. You don't, you don't wake up and fail. You went through a process that got you to failure. Are you hearing me? Just like success. Success is not a destination. Success is a journey through life. That's success. Number three, it's not, it's, it's not an objective. Number four, it's not the enemy. Let's stop giving the devil too much credit, huh? Let's, let's stop blaming the devil for everything. He's not that smart, you know. He can't give birth to a new thought. Satan has been doing what he's been doing for over 2,000 years. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. He knows nothing else. That's it. So you can't say that failure is the enemy. No, it's my choice. Failure is my choice. Say it with me. It's my choice. Because Jesus said, I, I have placed before you life and death, blessing and cursing. You choose life. He made it a multiple choice test, and then he gave you the answer. It's an open book test. Choose life. So let's not just take everything that we experience and say it's the devil. Because I have also learned that my adversity has, has become like this amazing fertilizer for my success. What is fertilizer made of? Poop. Crap. It's okay to say crap in church, right? What is fertilizer made of? Crap. It's made of a lot of poop. Think about it. Piles and piles of poop are placed everywhere. Then they take the poop, the crap, and then they take that crap through the process. And that process then turns the crap, the poop, into fertilizer. And then they take that fertilizer and they put it back onto the field. Who's the field? You and me. And then that fertilizer becomes something so much productive that fertilizer becomes something that ends up bringing more success. So in other words, God's saying, I can take your worst failure and I can use it to be the greatest fertilizer for the next success of your life. God, God loves our crap. Number five, failure is not irreversible. There's, not a, there's no such thing as a permanent mistake. There's nothing permanent with God. Failure's not a stigma. Failure's not a, it's not final, but here's my favorite one. Failure is not fatal. You're not going to die like Eutychus. Because there's life in you. You can still change. You're not gonna die. See it as an opportunity to take the right action and start again and do something with it. Look at Abraham, perfect example. Abraham should have stayed in the land and trusted in God when God told him, wait for me. But what does he do? Instead, he fled to Egypt because there was a drought. Desperation will make you do a lot of stupid things. Don't be desperate, singles. I'm getting old. Mm, he's all right. Does he got a job? Mm, okay, I'll t don't get don't get desperate because God says wait. But 
think about it, by no means did that mean that Abraham was a failure. He ended up being the greatest success. What about Moses? Moses is trying to help his people, right? He finally finds his conviction while he's in Egypt. He's like, man, something's not right here. Man, I'm not, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm an Israelite. I got I'm feeling God. And but you know what he did? He took matters into his own hands. And you know what he ends up doing? He ends up killing an Egyptian because he was trying to protect one of the Israelites. And then he went running off. And for 40 years, he lost 40 years of his life for one bad mistake. But God redeemed his mistake and met him at a burning bush and gave him a purpose and a plan again. Failure is not fatal. David should have been out in the field of battle, but instead, what did he do? He took another man's wife, Bathsheba. And then not only did he take Bathsheba, then he went ahead and had Bathsheba's husband murdered but he had to go through his process. And we know that he wasn't just sorry, he had a true repentant heart. The price was big, but but he pushed forward. Peter, Peter denied God three times. Man, when they came and said, aren't you that follower of Jesus? I've never seen the man. I don't even, I've never, who is Jesus? And he denies him three times, but he comes back to God because failure was not final. And his first sermon, he preached to, to, to 5,000 people. And they all said, the Bible says, and they were all cut to the heart. And they said, what must shall we do to be saved? If you're not failing, you're not trying. I'm telling you that right now. If you're not failing, you're not trying. It's not just, don't, don't, don't get caught up all in sin. It, it's, listen, don't let failure outside of you get inside of you and poison you. Because it'll do that to you. Here's a definition of righteousness, just so that we get all of the, any religious bones in our body out of the place, okay? Everybody thinks that righteousness is someone perfect. No, the true definition of righteousness is found in Proverbs 24, 16. It says, for a, man, a righteous man may fall, how many times? And then what? But the wicked shall what? Okay, so that means that seven times a day, you and I, we miss it. Per day. Seven times. That's God's definition of righteousness. However, don't get all happy on me now. Because some of you are like, hey, yay. <laughs> no, no, no. But it says, but the wicked. Everybody say, but the wicked. Okay, shall buy, fall by calamity. What's the wicked? The wicked is who knows, who understands and realizes their integrity, failure of integrity, character, morality, whatever it is. And you still pursue that, you are the wicked. But true righteousness is the person that knows how to fall seven times. And it's not that you're doing intentionally. It's just that you just, man, you foul. Like, dang, I missed that again. It's when you practice sin that makes you wicked. Don't make wickedness a sport. Don't become so good at it. Amen? All right, so what do I do now, Pastor? Pastor? Is if righteousness is not determined by how many times I fall, but how do I rise again? Great question. Ready? Number one, quick, let's go. Last five points. How do I move forward? Well, what caused the failure? Where did things fall down? When a plane crashes, after they look for bodies, what's the next thing they look for? The black box. Why do they look for the black box? Because they want to hear what happened. They don't know what happened until they start replaying that black box. They start hearing all the conversations and they realize, oh, it was uh, the left engine number two. That went bad. Now we know how this plane went down. But then they go deeper. So you have to ask yourself, number two, am I grateful for the experience? So many people have failed, and they're just living in the misery of that failure. No, how about learn from that failure and say, you know what? I'm going to be a better person now. I'm going to be a better follower of Jesus and then just run again. Number three, how can I turn this into a success? Okay, now I learn how not to do it. Now I better learn how to do it. Amen? Number five. Four, who can help me with this issue? Stop being a lone ranger. If you need help, get help. Get the right people in your life. Don't, don't get someone that's going to judge you, okay? If people are going to judge you, just say, you know what, stop. You're probably the wrong person. I shouldn't have shared this with you. I'm sorry. Please don't share this with anybody else. And then go find someone that's going to correct you, instruct you, and love you, and rebuke you, and then love you some more. And number five, where do I go from here? Well, 
Only you can answer that. Now what? Well, for me, I think that when we say, where do I go from here now? It's like, okay, I better draw closer to God. Because the days are short and the days are evil. Bow your head, close your eyes. Father, I thank you. Everybody lift your hand because this is a prayer for all of us. Father, you see our hands. We are, we are humbly coming before you and saying, please forgive us, Lord. We repent. And repentance means to change the direction of your thinking. Please forgive us for the direction of our thoughts. Help us to turn back to you, Father. Because as we turn back to you, you have open arms and you're ready to embrace us and hold us and remind us that life is still in us. Father, I thank you that nothing's too hard for you, nothing's too difficult for you. I pray that you would save us, Father. I pray that you would do something unique and special in our life. Thank you, Father, that our failure is not fa fatal. Our failure is not final. This is the day you have made. And Lord, thank you because we're going to rejoice in it and be glad in Jesus' name.